Hi folks, Tom Coy with yet another episode of Ann Arbor Shield. And they still have me in the studio, they still have me doing the show, which sometimes I question their wisdom on that. But here we are, and we got a good show. Um, today in studio, we have Matt Rose, senior paramedic, and to his left, Glenn McCormick, para, para, paramedic instructor. Paramedic instructor, see? We've already, we've already messed that up. Anyhow, so if you guys don't mind, uh, just give us a brief, uh, if you will, your resume, your synopsis of your career thus far. Absolutely. So I have been with HVA for about 11 years now. Uh, started as a EMT basic and then worked my way up to a senior paramedic and also worked on our critical care truck. Okay, so break it down for me. What does it mean when you come in at that? In other words, how many tiers are there, if you will, in the... Yeah, there's the a couple of differences between an EMT and paramedic, and I think actually, Glenn, you would probably be better okay. 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 letting them know the All differences right. there. All right. Go ahead, uh, EMT has about four months of training. Uh, classes are two nights a week with some Saturdays or two days a week. We teach six programs a year. And then our paramedic program after you've become an EMT is 14 months long, rather intense with uh, uh, clinicals that you have to do, plus the third rides, the internship and then licensing and testing in order to get your state license to be able to work as a paramedic. Gotcha. And lest I forget, so I'll throw it up now, I don't care who answers or both have different answers. What do you find is the number one motivating factor for most people that, that want to you know, be a paramedic um, for a career? I think for me it was I wanted to make an impact in the community and truly help people and I saw that as becoming a paramedic and being able to do that okay. by working on the ambulance. Okay. Me, I started volunteering in South Lyon where I grew up and from there turned it into a career in HV at HVA. I started, started working in this in 1980 and uh, started at HVA in 1983. Wow. And worked here for 12 and a half years and then left for a few years to another service north of us and then came back in the education department. So it's just always wanting to help the community, wanting to help somebody else and plus it's, it's a great adrenaline job. Right, and, and, and of course, I would probably answer the same thing with regard to one, one, of the re one of the reasons I got into police work was to help people, but we all realize, I'll be honest, it sounds a little idealistic, right? But <laughs> nonetheless, the truth is the truth, so it is. it is what it is. All right, so having said all that, let's cut to a clip uh, about uh, the history of paramedics or ambulances, if you will. In 1869, the Bellevue Hospital Medical College introduced the first ambulance service in the United States. The service was established to transport civilians to the hospital. Interns rode in these ambulances, doing whatever they could to comfort the patients. By the 1890s, this idea spread to other large city medical schools and hospitals. Yet by 1950, many small towns and rural areas still had no ambulance services some offering little more than transport by the local funeral home. Over the next 20 years, however, great strides in ambulance transportation took place. Most significantly, the extension of the hospital emergency room, or department, to the patient through the Emergency Medical Services, EMS, system. With this advancement, care could begin at the scene, continue during transport, and then be handed off to the staff in the hospital. By 1966, the National Highway Safety Act was passed, granting the responsibility for developing standards for training, assessment, and care to the Department of Transportation, DOT. This standardized EMTB training, assessment, and care. A fully standardized first responder national program was presented in 1994. Often, it seems that EMS response is a given, but its development and spread has taken well over 100 years. Okay, so we were talking uh, at break actually, um, and I was asking the question of uh, our guests here about uh, what launched, you know, what you saw there is obviously very primitive medical care, and what kind of, what was the catalyst that, that uh, changed things um, with regard to that? And you answered, Glenn. Go ahead. One of the shows I watched as a kid, by the way. 
So. <laughs> <laughs> One of the big catalysts for us was uh, the show Emergency with Johnny and Roy and uh, getting the paramedics started. It was based on LA County Fire, which they had had the service going for a few years. And after that was out, everybody started saying, why don't we have the paramedics in our area? Why don't we kind of look into this? So the next thing we know, paramedics started popping up all across the country. And that was really one of the catalysts. Mm -hmm. The other time that uh, helped us with TV was the old show um, Rescue 911 with William oh. Shatner. When wow. that show came on TV, our uh, class rates went up the people that wanted to join us really? and work in 911 as an EMT, the, the numbers just shot way up. So what I appreciate, Glenn, is your, your sharing of TV shows that I am aware of and was actually alive when these <laughs> shows were popular. Well, you, you know, we laugh, but a lot of us that have had a few years on, um, uh, Adam 12 was, mm -hmm. was what we, what really what we cut our teeth on. This really sounds bad, doesn't it? That TV influence, but it did. Um, when Adam 12, for many of us, was our I, I, ideal of being a police officer. And so it's kind of cool. Um, all right. Now, we've had some problems in studio today between Mark and Matt. <laughs> this is Matt. And for some reason, everybody keeps calling him Mark. I don't know why. So we apologize, Matt. That's fine. Um, I was asking him earlier, uh, what do you call, you know, what do you call the uh, ambulance? I thought it was rig, and you said and answered. We call it, I mean, a rig. It can be called a rig, a bus, a truck. I mean, it's got a lot of different names. Depends on, I guess, who you ask, who's driving that day. Gotcha. All right, and you were you were nice enough to bring the. I'm going to call it rig, just because I think it sounds cool. I've heard you guys refer yeah. to it as rig. Um, you brought the rig to CTN a while back, mm -hmm. and you did a nice tour inside. So maybe we could uh, cut to that a minute, and let's take a look. All right, so this is one of the typical ambulances that you'll see within Washtenaw County. This is one of our paramedic ambulances. You'll see the striping on the side. All of this to the normal eye looks normal, but when light is hit on, it's also very reflective. So if we're sitting on the side of the road, it can be seen from at nighttime and easily and protect the paramedics and firefighters that are on scene. It's also equipped with lights and sirens just like any other ambulance. Uh, another unique feature of all of our ambulances is that they are equipped and staffed exactly the same. So any paramedic from any of our divisions can hop in any of our ambulances and they'll be able to find things in the exact same place between all of them. So this is the standard interior of our ambulances. Again, like I said earlier, this is all set up identical. So any paramedic can get into one of these ambulances and everything will be in the exact same place. Some of the unique features are our striker stretchers that we carry here, um, as well as our mounting system for the stretcher underneath here. That's a new system that we just upgraded to. Um, it's been crash tested and safety tested. It's, this is one of the safest places to be in an ambulance during a transport. Um, a lot of people like to see how these actually work, so I'll go ahead and pull the stretcher out so you can see it. So you just depress the red button, pull the stretcher out, the wheels will lower down, it unhooks and then we can take it to our patient. Then you can also see the interior, this is the mounting system that's underneath the stretcher and that's what secures that stretcher down to the, the base of the ambulance. So this is the interior of our, one of our ambulances. So you can see the stretcher is down here. Um, we also carry some equipment underneath the seats. So we have additional oxygen tanks below the seat. We can take those right into where a patient is and deliver oxygen if they're having difficulty in breathing or any type of medical emergency where they would need additional oxygen. Throughout the entire ambulance, we carry a lot of equipment, similar equipment to what you would find in the emergency department. So we can bring basically emergency care directly to that patient on scene. So what we have in these cabinets over here, uh, this upper cabinet carries some airway devices such as intubation tubes that we can use to help a person breathe. There's bandaging supplies as well as other miscellaneous bleeding control. There's an OB kit for if someone's having a baby. And then we also have miscellaneous equipment down below that helps us move a patient from inside the house to our stretcher and then into our ambulance. One of the biggest pieces of equipment that we carry is our Life Pack 15, which is our cardiac monitor. So this machine can do everything. It can help us do a 12 lead EKG, determine if you're having a heart attack. It tells us the oxygen saturation within your blood. 
gives us blood pressure and multiple other parameters that we can use. And we also utilize it as a defibrillator. So it's a manual defibrillator in case of a cardiac arrest, we can utilize that to uh, help start a heart again. So some of the features that you can see on here, uh, this top green line, it's demonstrating a heart rate. So this one is actually showing kind of a fast heart rate at the moment. The next down, the blue here with the 99%, that's the oxygen saturation and correlates to this waveform on the monitor as well. This is just showing a basic temperature so we can monitor a patient's temperature. The bottom number here is the patient's blood pressure, 120 over 80, which is pretty much textbook. And then this orange line here correlates to the CO2 expired um, at the top here, which basically gives us information on how well a patient is breathing, how well that oxygen is going in and out of their system. What you may have seen on TV, doctor shows where they have the paddles and they just, they place them on the patient and shock them manually. We have stickers. So they just are placed just like a typical AED on the patient's chest. And those are a lot more accurate and able to provide a better, a better shock to the patient than, than the paddles are. So that's stored, stored in the side here and it would be hooked up through there. Okay, so what we carry in these compartments are some, also some vital equipment. So typically what would be stored up here is additional drug boxes. So we have a medication box if someone's in a severe traumatic accident, um, which would help us facilitate to intubate them or put a tube down their throat to help them breathe uh, to protect their airway from any blood or vomitus or anything like that. We carry that in Washtenaw County, which is kind of unique to us. And here in Valley Ambulance, not a lot of services within Michigan offer that capability of rapid sequence intubation. Um, secondly, down here, another unique thing for here in Valley Ambulance here in Washtenaw County is this pizza box looking thing. So what this is, is it's actually a blanket warmer. So we can put blankets in here, close it up, it keeps them warm. So if we have someone who is hypothermic or very cold, um, we can put the blankets on them to help facilitate warming them up. Or an elderly patient who gets colder, um, we can utilize these to, uh, to warm them up. It's basically like you pull a, a nice fresh blanket out of a dryer and it's, the patients really enjoy those. It's down below is what's known as our jump kit. So in that is basically everything we've gone over in the entire ambulance condensed down into a small box that we can take directly to a patient. So when we park outside, we'll take our medication box, we'll take our jump kit, we can take those right into a patient, start treating them in their own home or in the car or wherever it is that we find them. And then once we get them stabilized, we transfer them to the stretcher and then bring them into the ambulance. So now we are in the interior front of the ambulance. The first piece of equipment that we have is our mobile data computer. On this computer here, we're going to see the information that dispatch is providing to us. So what you'll see here is your basic GPS map on the top. So it shows the location of our ambulance as well as the location of where we're responding to. So in the lower section here, this is going to provide information about the call that we're responding to. So it's going to provide information such as the address that we're going to, the patient's name and apartment number, any important information that we need for the paramedics to find that call. Secondly, in there, in the lower section, we also have notes pertaining to what's going on at that scene or with that patient. So as the dispatcher is on the phone with the caller or a bystander and is getting more information like the patient has become unconscious, they're having more trouble breathing, all of that information in real time is updated in the, this computer and those paramedics that are responding to the call are able to read that and then prepare themselves to know what equipment they're going to need to take into that patient, whether they're going to need additional oxygen, breathing equipment. That way they're able to prepare and be, be ready with that information once they reach the patient. So secondly in the ambulance is our emergency equipment. So up here is all the controls for the lights and the siren. So up here, this is our siren. And down here is our emergency lights. This would turn on our emergency lights as well as some other scene lighting if we need it during the night or the day. Other area down here is our 800 megahertz radio system. So what this is, is a communication system statewide that we can communicate with any of our ambulances from anywhere within the state of Michigan. We can communicate with the fire departments. We can also communicate with any police departments. So if we're going to a larger incident where the fire and police are going to be there. We can communicate with them because typically they'll arrive first and they can give us updated information of where we need to park, where we can find the, the patient, what the patient's condition is, if we need additional resources. So it's a great connection within Washtenaw County that all of the departments are connected to. Okay, don't ask me why, Matt, but I almost said Mark again. That's why I had to write it out. I had to. No, all right, so at break, I said to you guys, uh, 
you know, I've been here 25 years, and my wife and I were actually discussing this. And I said, I always found it curious that it said nonprofit underneath. And I said, um, though I am, I am called a uh, idealist by some of my colleagues, I find it hard to believe that anybody would maintain a business where, you know, you have zero profit. So, in summation, can you just explain, one of you, what that means to yeah, the public? Absolutely. If, if they care. So there's different models of ambulance services. There can be a for-profit company which puts uh, the funds that they get from transporting patients uh, into shareholders and the executives. There's the community model where it's government tax-based. And us, we are a nonprofit community-owned service. So we're actually a 501c3 organization. So we're classified uh, as a nonprofit organization. So all of the funds that we get go back into the actual organization to purchase new ambulances, more equipment, so there's no profits that go out to a shareholder or a larger company or organization like that. It's all gotcha. kind of kept in the service and helps us grow and expand. Gotcha. And Glenn, you, I think you're the go-to guy with this one. Um, uh, number one, we were commenting that, you know, from my perspective as an officer, you guys always seem to have the very latest equipment. You know, it's, it's always, uh, you seem very well funded and taken care of, which mm -hmm. I'm sure as paramedics you can certainly appreciate. The other, th the other question I had for you, though, was rumor had it that HVA took over for whoever it was, doesn't matter, uh, but they were, you know, the community didn't like them for whatever reason, inept service or what have you, and HVA took over. Now you folks, I mean, I see you in Wayne County, I see you in Lenaway County, I see you obviously in Washtenaw County, and so can you explain, I mean, because not, I'm not aware of any other ambulance service or a paramedic service that has that far reach. Actually you're right. There was uh, two ambulance services in the county that um, were in competition with each other. Uh -huh. One was doing okay, the other one was not doing so well. They went to the county and said Look, we need something and they ended up, the county said we really don't want to get involved so the hospitals in the area got involved uh -huh. and that's where Huron Valley Ambulance was formed by the hospitals purchasing the two ambulance services and making our service. Um, at that time we only covered Washtenaw County one county, five ambulances, and now we cover nine counties, about 7,000 square miles, about 25% of Michigan's population wow. is covered by Huron Valley Ambulance. If somebody calls 911 in southeastern Michigan and requests an ambulance, one of our trucks show up. Wow, that's huge, So, but, but I have to ask, right? So we'll leave the county out of it. So a county would contacted HVA at some point and said, hey, can you, spin a spiel for us and tell us what you can offer and then they obviously bought into it because that's where we see them now so how does that how does that work actually it's a request for service more than purchasing in they don't purchase ah. into our service they request our service ah, and then okay. contracts are are put in they of course look at the demographics and then the contracts will come up and will be there for so long and uh, hopefully continue to maintain the service that they had or better service than what they had before gotcha and um, nice job. You did a nice job on the rig, uh, by the way, filming it. Thank you. So take us through, I don't want to say a typical call because it's like police work, you know. No, no call is typical. Um, but, but for someone watching, what is the sequence of events? Let's, uh, let's say it's a traffic crash, a relatively serious one. W what is the sequence that happens when you folks finally arrive on scene? So a lot of the time we, we respond with the fire department. So the fire department will get there, kind of stabilize the scene for us. We'll get there shortly after them. And then it's up to us. We'll go in and take a look at that patient to determine, you know, what we're going to need. So we'll be able to take that jump kit that we showed you, our oxygen, our cardiac monitor, right up to that, that patient's car. And while the fire department's working to extricate that, them, the patient will work with the fire department and start, we can start treatments depending on the severity of their injury. If it's something severe, we can place an IV in, start giving medications, and some oxygen, and then based on their injury severity, we can determine what hospital we're gonna ultimately transport them to. Gotcha. And I know that, that Dean, you, you touched, or Glenn, touched on earlier, the educational requirements are different for an EMT versus a paramedic. So my question to you is, in just a, a quick synopsis, essentially, what is the difference to the public with regard to an EMT being on scene or besides the transportation, you know, the transporting obviously is one difference mm -hmm. between the EMT and a paramedic, but. The paramedics have the IVs that they can start. Um, they're they're going to have certain medications that they could possibly give, monitoring the heart. The basic EMTs do not 
uh, start IVs in our area, and they also don't have the heart monitor. Uh, so it, it is a higher level of care. Uh, but all of our employees go through a class called pre-hospital trauma life support, mm -hmm. and that's a requirement to work in the area. And it kind of sharpens everybody's skills for any kind of trauma that they might be on, or the call that they might be on. It sharpens their skills for trauma. Gotcha. And to ca I think to caveat on to that, in Washtenaw County, we're kind of unique that all of our ambulances are staffed with two paramedics. Mm -hmm. So some ambulance companies provide a paramedic and an EMT. But in Washtenaw County, we're required to have two paramedics, and then when you call 911, you're only going to get a paramedic ambulance. You won't get a basic ambulance. Gotcha. So those are and who that's, respond. Yeah, that's huge. Um, one comment, uh, I was watching, preparing for the show, I'm watching some clips of paramedics and stuff, and I did run across a number of communities that had one paramedic responding, trying to, trying to carry a jump box, the oxygen, <laughs> and I'm thinking to myself, what is this poor person going to, you know, if they have to, oh my goodness, man. So, um, other than reducing cost, obviously, by only having one paramedic, why would why in the world would you have just one paramedic? I mean, I'm not trying to get you guys in trouble. No, you, no, no. This doesn't apply okay. to you, but I'm just saying, <laughs> how would you even affect, I guess what I'm saying is, how would you effectively do your job as a paramedic when you know, there's only one of you? So you still can do, get a lot done. So we actually, in our rural areas in Washtenaw County, uh -huh. we staff what's called a paramedic echo unit. Oh, okay. So that's a single ambulance with one senior trained paramedic who's had a lot of experience. And you can get on that scene before the fire department, before the other uh, paramedic ambulance gets there. And we carry a little bit different jump kit that's got a strap and it's a little bit easier to carry everything in. And it's still a ton of stuff. I'll bet. Um, but we can start treatments quickly. So I can do a quick assessment on that patient uh, place an IV, give some life-saving medication before that transporting ambulance gets there. So you're able to kind of stop the clock. Gotcha. So we get there a little okay. bit quicker. It is more difficult. That person isn't going to take someone to the hospital. They're just there to treat life-saving emergency situations before the, the ambulance can get there. Gotcha. Okay. Um, when we come back in from this, uh, one of my favorite comedians, I just had it through in there, Brian Regan on ERs and so forth. Um, be thinking about um, a call uh, I don't want to say that will stay with you forever, <laughs> but uh, a call. Well, I want I want people to get an idea of something that you deal with. I mean, obviously they see you on scene at traffic crashes and and maybe some other things, but maybe um, a call that just resonates with you over your career and that you typically you know would respond to that people aren't aware. So be thinking like that. So w with that said, we'll go to uh, Brian Regan for a little comic relief for just a moment. I'm feeling good. I, I actually just recently had to go to the emergency room, though, and I had some stomach virus thing. I almost called an ambulance. It's weird, even considering calling an ambulance for yourself. You know? You call ambulances for other people, right? What are you supposed to say about yourself? Can you come get me? <laughs> yeah, I don't feel so good. Just come on in. I'll be lying on the floor. Just looking at the phone going, I don't know how to do this. I don't know what to do. It was at night, so I drove myself to the emergency room. That's a nice relaxing drive. No, after you. Merge, everybody, merge. I'm only imploding. So I, I pull up at the entrance to the emergency room. No valet parking. I mean, if that's not the biggest oversight in our solar system. If there's ever a time where you want to go, can you park this because I need to collapse immediately. But no, I'm circling around a parking lot. Can I park there? I think I'm going to die. I'm dying too. Okay, go ahead. I'll go up a couple levels. <laughs> Unbelievable. I don't care if you're driving yourself or someone else to the emergency room. You still want to get out and run in with them. Are you supposed to drop somebody off and go park a car? Okay, you go in. <laughs> Tell them you're shot. Ask 
ask them if they validate. Unbelievable. All right. You got to love Brian Regan. At least I do. All right. So while we were doing that, uh, I asked you guys to come up with um, a story to give a flavor, an idea of, of what a paramedic does day in, day out. So who wants to go first? I can. It's, All right, Glenn. You know, it, it's an adrenaline type job. It's something you, when the adrenaline starts, when that call comes in, the lights and siren come on, get your adrenaline flowing, and then making a difference in somebody's life. I, my, I remember my first cardiac arrest save that we had. The gentleman was at the unemployment office, but he owned a business. He was there looking for people to work for him. He was only in his mid-50s and collapsed. We happened to be there very quickly, which time is of the essence in a cardiac arrest situation. We did CPR. We gave him medications. By the time we got him to the hospital, he uh, had a heartbeat back. He was talking to us. And we went up several times over the next couple of weeks and talked to him and, and just to see how he was doing. Because at that time in our career, uh, cardiac arrest saves were not very often. And so it was the, the first one that I did. And nowadays we have a lot of people, we try to teach as much CPR as possible and teach people how to use AEDs because they're everywhere and they really do save lives. We're seeing those numbers rise up and, and help the, uh, the victims when they go down. Gotcha. Uh, but just, I don't know, it's probably one of the best calls that I've ever been on. Yeah, I can appreciate that. Okay. Yeah, so like Glenn said, those are some, of the, some great calls too, but I think the ones that stick out to me are the, the kind of the oddball questions because you never know what you're going to you're going to roll up on and one that one that sticks out to me it was a Super Bowl Sunday and we got called for a patient who said she had been burned we're like oh I wonder you know what's going on they didn't give us much information they kind of abruptly hung up with the dispatcher so we arrive there go inside her house and she's sitting on her couch and she looks perfectly fine and I asked her you know have, have you been burned she's like yes I was burned eight years ago and well I'm like why did why are we here today? What, did you burn yourself again? She's like, no, I just can't find the Super Bowl on the TV. So we had to... We <laughs> Welcome had to, to my world. We had to help her find the Super Bowl on the TV, change the channel for her, and uh, we left her with law enforcement after that. <laughs> and I think they gave her a little stern warning. But, I mean, Glenn's right. Those calls that uh, we really make an impact, they, they stick with you, but the, those funny ones yeah, are yeah, also yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I, entertaining I, as well. I, yes, folks. Yes, folks. People really do call 911 for situations such as this and other bizarre situations. Trust me on that one. Um, you touched on something I thought was important, so I'll bring it uh, forward now, Glenn. Uh, back in the day when I watched John and Roy do their thing, I love the paddle thing. I, I always got to kick, man, <laughs> you know. All right, so we had that way back in the day, and obviously that's, that was to reinitiate uh, the heart again. Now we have an AED, yes. okay? Uh, so what I want, I want you to do real, real quick is just um, touch on, I guess, essentially what, what an AED does, number one, and uh, then we'll come back. Go ahead. Okay, an AED is a uh, automated external defibrillator, and again, they're everywhere. Um, shopping malls, police cars, fire trucks, our basic EMT cars have them. Anywhere that you can think of, airports, casinos, I guess, really have a lot of them. And uh, when the heart stops, it usually is in a quivering mode. And what it does is it sends a, an electrical shock through the heart that will hopefully restart it. Um, for the computer people out there, you can kind of think of it as a control alt delete for the heart. It restarts the heart, hopefully, so that the heart starts beating and CPR is not necessary. So it really brings them back from the dead, saves their lives. Without it, uh, the chances of survival drop dramatically every minute that somebody's not doing CPR or that an AED is not attached. Okay, and we were gonna save this for later, but I did remember. Um, so we'll, we'll go to you, Matt. Um, if, you had, if you had one thing that you wanted to get across to the public as they tune in today with regard to medical emergencies, the things that you guys deal with and gals deal with day in and day out, that can make a real difference in your response or uh, once you get there, what have you, what would, what's the number one thing that kind of sticks in your mind with regard to that? Yeah, I think it's a tie in to what Glenn was saying. The, the biggest thing now is uh, knowing CPR and performing that. So if you witness someone go down, the likelihood of them recovering from CPR has increased 75% oh, wow. by immediate CPR being given. 
And now we no longer have to do the mouth to mouth. So if you're in the mall and it's a stranger or someone like that, just pushing hard and fast, um, doing that CPR is really going to make a huge impact. And then the AEDs, as Glenn was saying earlier, they would walk you through the, you turn it on and a voice yeah. prompts you. They put patches here, do this, do that. Yes. And it will walk you through it. So it's, True. you can't hurt somebody by, by doing that CPR and then placing that AED and, you know, taking care of that patient before the paramedics are able to arrive. Okay. And this is your bailiwick, um, Glenn. So somebody's watching. Bailiwick, Glenn. No. Uh, <laughs> somebody's watching, and um, like I said to my wife the other day, because I do have a lot of heart history in my family, even though I try to take care of myself, I said, honey, you know, it wouldn't be a bad idea. And I said this seriously. It wouldn't be a bad idea for you to, like, take a basic CPR class, you know. And she uh, said something like, Something you want to share with me? Or? <laughs> no, I just think I, I just I, I just think it's a good thing. So, all right. So I'm I'm uh, intrigued by the whole CPR thing. I've heard this, and um, where would I go for a reputable uh, source for CPR? How much am I looking to spend on that? How much time involvement to learn basic CPR? We teach a CPR class the first Friday of every month at our facility over here on State Circle. Um, cost. Yeah. I'm not positive. I want to say yeah. it's right around thirty dollars. Okay. Okay. Time frame. You're looking. The classes are scheduled from eight to noon. But depending on the size of the class, if there's a, if it's a smaller class, we'll okay. be out in about three, three and a half hours, okay. and uh, we will teach you CPR. Plus, if you keep an eye on our website, a couple times a year we have been teaching a free class, um, completely free CPR class and first aid class also. Okay. And we do that twice a year. And if there's an organization in Ann Arbor, a company, something that has employees that they need uh, trained, they can call us and we will set up a time to come out, a minimum of 10 employees, and that cost is about $45. But we will be happy to come out and teach classes at your site, at your facility. That's outstanding. And, and I agree that of all the, uh, I had a father who died of a heart attack, so I would say of all the skills that is worth that nominal investment, uh, CPR certainly is. Um, okay, we will go to a clip of a typical day. I didn't know there was a, a Boston <laughs> paramedic or whatever it is show. I ran across it. The last one I saw was John and uh, Roy because it's all about police work, you know, when you're a cop. Um, but anyhow, let's go to Boston paramedics here, and uh, it's kind of a human relations story here. for uh, the Symphony Hall, Boston Symphony Hall, for a knee laceration. They're trying to control the bleeding. 95-year-old female. You get to go to places you've never been to before in this job. I like the opera, I like classical music, so, uh, you know, I'm excited to go inside. Sounds like you fell onto your knees. Yeah, and it's a metal knee. Oh, you got to you replace a little bionics in there? Oh, am I a bionic? We like that. I have a stent in here and a screen in here. <laughs> and it sounds like you got a pretty good tear to your knee there, huh? Okay, and just hurt right in that one spot? Is it hurt in the back of the knee? When you fell down, did you hit your head at all? No. And you didn't lose consciousness or no. anything like that? No, I wouldn't do that. I, of course you wouldn't, not on purpose anyways. Do you have any type of discomfort other than that knee? I'm annoyed that I'm not inside watching the program. What, what program was it? What was it? Uh, we don't even. You didn't even know what it was. <laughs> Come on, in '95, who the? Used to fan a, they, just a fan of the, the show and all that stuff. They entertain us. Absolutely, the extremely well put together lady, 95 years old and looked like she was about 60 tops. She clearly is healthy in her mind, her body, and everything else. I played golf on the women's med team matches for years. What's your handicap? Old age and liquor. <laughs> <laughs> too good. That's way too good of a response. Okay, so we'll take you to the Brigham today and get that all fixed no. up for you. Oh, absolutely. You got to get no, that. I can't. No, I'm not going to vote. Why do I have to? It's all done. Yeah, and it looks pretty because it's in a bandage, but when right. I take that bandage off, it's still bleeding. I can't fight you. I can't. Ah, see that? I'm glad I wore fancy underwear. Very <laughs> fancy. <laughs> I have to tell you, Gladys is like a magnet. Everybody wants to be around her because she's such an upbeat person. I love life. 
I look forward to every day. So that's your secret to saying so, uh, so vivacious at 95? The most important thing is exercise, good food, and you got to read and not be playing with the damn electronics all the time. Oh, yes, I do have a computer. Oh, yes, I, I mean, I'm savvy. But there's so much to learn, and I'm curious, and every day I hope I learn more. Boston EMS, they're kind and considerate. And handsome? That handsome goes without oh, saying. Thank you. One is better looking than the other, but they all have to lose weight. See? That's a lose weight. I get that a, I get that a lot of corn. <laughs> all right. Why in the world of all the clips that I ran across would I show that versus something really, you know, gory and the things that you guys deal with life and death every day? Um, because, you know, I, I think so often it isn't what we do, it's how we do it. And over the years, I've just noticed with paramedics, too, that uh, they're very congenial and um, make a huge impact. And before I forget, um, I want to say in all seriousness, I don't know who coined the phrase unsung heroes, but I really believe that about paramedics. I've um, been doing this 28 years. And I really do believe with all my heart that they are the unsung heroes in our society and uh, undervalued sometimes, well, often. And, uh, you know, we see life and death occasionally. These folks see it daily, hourly sometimes. So thank you for what you do, gentlemen. Thank you. Thank you. Um, all right, so before we leave, you, you commented on the, uh, the one thing that you would admonish people to do um, so let's, we'll do this. Now, I asked you the question, so you're not going to get in trouble by any supervisors. <laughs> as a paramedic and as a educator, give me your top pet peeve when you're on a call, doesn't matter what kind, but your top thing. Now, for a cop, okay, I'll go out there. One of my pet peeves as an officer is when I'm in public and a, a well-intentioned parent has a child and says something along the lines of, be good, or he, meaning me, will take you to jail. Yeah, that's a pet peeve for me because, you know what? Your, kid, your children need to run to somebody who's safe. They're not going to run to me if, if they think the worst of me. So that's one of my pet peeves. Anyhow, all right, pet peeve. Well, I think it's uh, when we're get, we just get called ambulance drivers. Um, so that's kind of a big hot topic with sure. paramedics as we go through all this training yeah. and education, and uh, we like to uh, to be known as, as the true clinical professionals that we are. So if someone just Absolutely. refers to us as, you know, the guy that drives the ambulance, because we do, we do drive it. Granted, we do drive it, but we do a lot more than that as well. So, so what would you like? I mean, I don't think, I might be wrong, but I don't think the average person would say paramedic. They probably wouldn't use that because they're not familiar with that vernacular. So what would you prefer in all seriousness? Um, you know, really, I, I think a lot of people do know the, the okay. title paramedic. Okay. Paramedic. Okay. So paramedic, what, it doesn't matter what scope if you're an EMT or okay. whatever. Okay. I think. So you wouldn't take it as an insult. They no. said, "Oh, EMT is EMT." No, 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 uh, no, no, no. Okay. Okay. Cool. No. That that makes sense. All right. As an as an educator, people come to you. Let's say to be educated in CPR or whatever uh, situation is. What's your number one pet peeve? Well, from the education standpoint, I really don't have any pet peeves. Okay. When I worked the road, I used to have a lot of them. You know. <laughs> All right, give me one from your, <laughs> give me one from your road. We, we heard uh, Matt. Uh, mine was always people that came up and would knock on the window and say, why do you sit here with your ambulance running all the time? We why have, does that resonate with me? <laughs> <laughs> we have IVs, medications. We have to keep it a certain temperature. We have to keep a heater going in the winter and kind of keep them a little bit cooler in the summer or the medications will go bad. They, they won't be effective. They won't work. So people never quite understood that, and they'd always, and I've had a lot of different people come yeah, up yeah. Uh, here, everywhere that I've been, that come up and go, why? Why do you do this? And I said, well, we have to. You know, we have to maintain the temperature. Right, right. And as my buddy would say, who, you know, occasionally, we'll leave our cars running, usually sub-zero or 90 degree temperatures. Anyhow, leave our car running, and we get the same thing, right? And he said, well, Ma'am, sir, let me ask you this. When you leave your office, when you leave your home, do you turn everything off and just walk out the door? <laughs> and, you know, it's, there's an element of truth to that other than uh, being smart. But um, <laughs> is that, you know, we share that. That is to say, our vehicle is our office, our working space. Everything happens there. This isn't just a car, you know, you drive or, or a rig. You drive from point A to point B, get out and, and do whatever. 
you're in that thing for you know, 8, 10, 12 hours a day. And obviously, among other things, you need to be comfortable so that you're able to you know, offer the optimum service. Do you like the way I put that? Optimum yeah. service? Yeah. Absolutely. Optimum service on that. So, anyhow. Um, okay, gents, anything that you want to share with the public uh, with regard to what you do, what uh, you admonish them to do with regard to maybe injuries you see? I don't know. It's up to you, whatever you want to share. But we'll go with you first, Glenn. I can see. <laughs> Glenn, is, <laughs> Glenn is poised. He's ready. Yeah, poised and ready. Um, well, the biggest thing is CPR classes, CPR education, of course, and then also EMT education. If you're interested in this field, contact us. We're happy to sit down and talk with individuals, or we could talk as a group. We can explain what an EMT does, what a paramedic does, the training, the costs that are involved. And right now, we have some, as a company, if you're working for us, we have some excellent programs to keep your costs down when it comes to becoming a paramedic. And if I and playing the devil's advocate, which I love to do on this show, because I, well, yeah, anyhow, um, I say to you with, with regard to this medical training, that's what we have paramedics for. That's what we have police for. That's what we have fire uh, departments for. Uh, the chances of someone around me or in my family having a medical emergency that I need to be trained for is so remote. I, I'm not going to take the time to do that. I can understand that, uh, but. We do, we do have a, a need right now for EMTs and paramedics. There's about a 25% shortage in our state and across the country. Wow. So we have a need for people to come in, not just to help your friends, family, but it's a possible, it's a good career. Yeah. And I've been doing it for a very long time and enjoy it. If you enjoy going to work, you never work a day in your life. Nice. And when you, you, you go in and know that you made a difference in yeah, somebody's absolutely. life, it, it makes the difference in everything yeah, you absolutely. do. Absolutely, you got it. I'm going to put you on the spot. I said that you could do whatever you want, but what I would like you to talk <laughs> okay. on real briefly is not only the use of car seats, but the proper use of car seats. And the number one thing I hear as an officer, at least over the years, has been I just can't get my kids into the seat. And, and I just, I mean, you know, I, mean, I, I get it. I had three of my own, believe it or not. Um, and initially, it is a struggle to get them, quote unquote, trained to be in that seat and comfortable. So can you speak to that and with regard to what you see day in and day out and the importance of that? Absolutely. I think it's, it's critically important that we have the car seats secured properly and the children fastened in there properly, especially in the wintertime when they have the big heavy yeah, coats yeah. and the straps aren't tight enough. Um, it, it's vital because I've been on multiple car accidents where that car seat being secured properly saved that child's life. Yes. That is the safest place anywhere in that vehicle for that child. Absolutely. Um, so having those secured and doing it properly is, is very important. And if you don't know how to do it, if you're confused about it, um, most of our fire departments, they offer car seat training or up at the University of Michigan Hospital. I know they do that yes. at Mott Children's yep. Hospital as well. So if there's any question, it does not hurt to ask because that is a vital thing to, to know and use properly. And you, and you make a good point in that, you know, you could have a child in a car seat, but if the harness isn't, you know, mm -hmm. if everything isn't fitting correctly and it's not secure, it may be better than nothing, but it, it, it's, it's going to cause sure. injuries that if it were not uh, done right. And by the way, my partner, Doug Martell, uh, at the Ann Arbor Police Department has just recently been trained in that. Great. So you can get contact him as well, or um, like Matt said, you can contact U of M Mots for that. That wraps up the show, and I, and I meant uh, uh, sincerely my comment about unsung heroes. I appreciate what uh, the men and women do out there for the community and for the cooperation we've had over the years. And as I told you guys on break, I always sigh. <laughs> when I'm on a medical or some other hot call, I always sigh a relief when you, when you folks pull up. So thank you for what you do, and thanks for being on the show today. Thank you. That will do it for today's uh, show. Give us, again, give us a call at uh, Ann Arbor if you, if you have some more questions about the car seats. That's Officer Doug Martell. Yes, Doug, you will have work to do, my friend. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I'll owe you lunch. But anyhow, that's it for next time, and uh, we'll see you then.